Malta was created by a group of community leaders in the Latino community, lawyers and others, who saw the need in the court system for representation of the Latino community and an organization that was dedicated to promoting the civil rights of Latinos. At the time, in 1968, the Latino population was concentrated in the Southwest, as well as with pockets in Chicago, New York, and Florida. And in all of those areas where there were significant Latino populations, there were widespread patterns of exclusion, discrimination at work, discrimination in the schools, discrimination throughout society. And there was a need to be able to call on a legal organization to challenge that exclusion and discrimination in the courts. There's many components of what MALDEF does, litigation, advocacy, and education. And MALDEF has been uncompromising in its efforts to advance the education levels of Latinos in America. Our effort is to ensure that every Latino has the rights guaranteed them by the Constitution, whether that's in education, or in employment, or in voting, or in ensuring that laws don't target Latinos or others based on their immigration status or their assumed immigration status. As we all know, the anti-immigrant rhetoric hits across the board and has had such a tremendous impact. But the work that MALDEF has done in showing that this Constitution is to work for every single one of us has been so very effective. And it's unfortunate that we have to go to this level, but again, all civil rights, our civil rights are not going to be won by just talking about it. It's going to be about taking the kind of legal action that we need to take in our courts. But if you don't have MALDEF and the kind of experience and tenacity and devotion of lawyers as well as the talent of those lawyers, nothing will change. And our community benefits by, by MALDEF's work. What I'm most proud of about MALDEF is how it has withstood the test of time as an organization for the advocacy and litigation and education of Latinos in America and that they have been surviving and fighting relentlessly to protect the constitutional rights of Latinos living in America. I take pride in that. I take pride in knowing not only I'm a board member, but knowing that our community is in great hands. So I'm proud of the efforts of our policy uh, staff, of our legislative attorneys nationwide, from D.C. to all of the state capitals, in working to ensure that we have laws that better protect the civil rights of Latinos, and better serve our national interests in inclusion and incorporation of all communities in our future progress. But we also recognize that the opportunities to push back on those who would seek to restrict the rights of Latinos, who would seek to restrict the application of our long-standing constitutional principles and values, those opportunities, coupled with the challenges of a growing demand for our services, is something that the dedicated staff of MALDEF uh, is looking forward to pursuing with great vigor throughout this decade. It is a new era. The landscape of America has been changing in a Latino way for, for a while. I see great things for MALDEF. The future is bright for MALDEF. They have proven time and time again that they are the first organization to take action legally and say we are going to protect our community through the Constitution of the United States. Great things lie ahead. Every challenge that is going to face the Latino community, MALDEF welcomes it. Live from Guadalupe Cultural Arts Center in San Antonio, Texas, welcome to MALDEF's 2013 State of the State. Please welcome MALDEF's Southwest Regional Council, David Hinojosa. On behalf of MALDEF, our board of directors, and our president and general counsel, Thomas Sines, welcome, bienvenidos, to the first ever 2013 Latino State of the State in Texas. I want to thank each of you for joining us this evening as we discuss some critical issues facing Latinos here in Texas in the areas of education, voting rights, immigration, and access to public resources such as health care. Of course, these issues are not meant to be an exhaustive list, nor is the discussion here tonight meant to be exclusive within each area. But we do want to highlight some of the real challenges facing Latinos in these areas, as well as some of the successes in discussing the state of Latinos in Texas. In the area of education, Latinos make up a majority of Texas's 5 million plus public school students, 
and a plurality over 40% of Texas high school graduates. Yet 40 years after the historic U.S. Supreme Court decision in Rodriguez versus San Antonio ISD, where a group of Latino parents in the Edgewood School District of San Antonio challenged the state's grossly unequal funding system, we find ourselves fighting for equitable funding yet again for all Texas school children. And while we cannot deny the progress made in closing the gap in funding over the years, for every giant step we take forward, the state forces us to take a step back. We also find ourselves fighting against high stakes testing in K-12 education. We find ourselves fighting against tracking students into less rigorous high school plans by not requiring Algebra II for all Texas graduates. And we know which students will be tracked into those lesser programs. And we find ourselves fighting for the right to access higher education. In the area of voting, while approximately 40% of all Texans are Latinos, only one out of every four persons eligible to vote in Texas is Latino. And only 53% of those Latinos eligible to vote are registered to vote. And voter turnout among Latinos remains dismally low. And yet, as Latinos continue to grow in numbers and in influence, we find ourselves in the courts and in the Texas legislature, fighting against discriminatory redistricting plans, fighting against a voter ID law that has nothing to do with fraudulent voting, and fending off other efforts aimed at disenfranchising Latino and other minority voters. In the area of immigration, one out of every six Texans is foreign born. Texas's business, Texas businesses continue to rely substantially on the backs of immigrant labor, reaping billions in revenue and taxes for Texas. Yet, we find ourselves every two years fighting to defeat mean-spirited legislation aimed at treating working immigrants as second-class people and tearing families apart, fighting against anti-immigrant ordinances such as those in Farmer's Branch, and city policies targeting day laborers and their free speech right to solicit employment in public places. The hostility towards immigrants and Latinos in Texas can be summed up in the words of a leader of an anti-immigrant group who reportedly stated that the reason they can't get any anti-immigrant legislation passed in Texas is because we have too many Hispanic legislators. In other areas affecting access to public resources, such as health care, Latinos lag substantially behind in access to quality health care. Yet, we see legislation aimed at curtailing Medicaid and the CHIP program, and now restricting access to reproductive health care, efforts that will undoubtedly endanger those most in need. And now, it is my great pleasure to introduce one of the most brilliant legal minds in our profession. And he is the right person to be leading Maldef's proud tradition of defending the civil rights of Latinos living in the United States. Please welcome Maldef's president and general counsel and your moderator for Maldef's 2013 State of the State, Thomas Sines. Thank you, David, for that over generous introduction, but most important for your now almost 10 years of working for MALDEF and for the Latino community in San Antonio and throughout the country to promote the civil rights of every Latino living in the United States. Good afternoon, San Antonio. And greetings to everyone watching across the country online. Welcome to our first Latino State of the State discussion in Texas. It is, of course, right that we be here particularly in San Antonio, Texas, because it is here that we were founded. 45 years ago this very month, MALDEF opened its doors in San Antonio after efforts led by Tejano attorney Pete Tijerina and other community activists from throughout the Southwest led to the creation of this critical organization. Of course, 45 years later, I'm proud to say we're still here. David Hinojosa leads an office with seven other staff members continuing to serve the needs 
of Texas continuing to serve the needs of the nation in ensuring that all of the critical rights are respected. And of course, those of you here in Texas know that there is still a need in this state, despite great progress in those 45 years, for the work that MALDEF does. To demonstrate that, I only need cite three recent victories of our own MALDEF office here in Texas. Most recently, we had an unexpected but welcome victory in front of the Fifth Circuit and Bank, that means every judge on that circus, circuit, concluding, consistent with arguments presented by our Vice President Nina Perales, that the City of Farmers Branch could not require that every tenant seeking to rent housing obtain a license, with the cost of that license for those who are not citizens being further investigation and the possibility of being expelled not just by the landlord from their housing, but ultimately from the entire city. The Fifth Circuit struck that down in a case that MALDEF brought. Just before that, we had another victory against League City, Texas, stopping successfully its attempts to prevent day laborers from seeking work, seeking to support their families on the city's streets and sidewalks. And before that, of course, in a rep repetition of what we've seen throughout MALDEF's history, we had yet another victory against the Texas school financing scheme in the Edgewood case. So many cases named Edgewood, so many victories, so much more still to do with respect to ensuring equal educational opportunity in this state. So we're proud to still be here where we were founded, proud to still serve. But as appropriate as our location is for this discussion, it's equally auspicious that we meet at this time. MALDEF is at bottom a legal constitutional organization. It's led, its staff is led by legal nerds, including the nerd in chief. <laughs> and you'll forgive us, but so often we time our lives around what the Supreme Court is deciding, when it might be deciding, what it will decide, and how that might impact the work that we carry on. So June, a few months ago, is a critical time of the year for us. We sit by our computers and wait and see when the Supreme Court might decide and how it will decide some of the critical civil rights cases before it. And in this year, 2013, this June, so many of those cases, those critical civil rights cases, had a direct effect, had a direct impetus from the state of Texas. Of course, one of those cases where we saw a victory was the case of Fisher versus University of Texas, where the presence of the Latino community, the presence of Latino students in this state, led to significant representation at the University of Texas, not nearly commensurate with the community's representation among those in high school, but still significant representation. And that fact and that fact alone put the University of Texas at the front of the line for those restrictionists who seek to eliminate, who seek to restrict equal educational opportunity. They chose to challenge the University of Texas's limited consideration of race in seeking to obtain a diverse, a representative student body. Fortunately, the Supreme Court announced and seemingly secured for the foreseeable future the same test to apply to affirmative action programs that was announced 10 years ago. Meaning that the University of Texas, we believe, will be able to successfully defend on remand its program. Meaning that universities across the country could continue to take into account the continued effects of race on the experience of students applying to them for admission. A case out of Texas. And the other significant case, one that I know you all have heard about, Shelby County versus Holder. This one did not come out so well. The Supreme Court dealt a severe blow to one of the most powerful provisions in the Voting Rights Act of 1965, striking down the coverage formula that ensured that the state of Texas, the state of Arizona, and multiple other states and counties around the country would be required to subject their electoral changes to a pre-approval or pre-clearance 
process. By striking down that coverage formula, the Supreme Court majority took a giant step backwards and permitted jurisdictions in every one of those covered jurisdictions to begin to implement changes that previously had been blocked, had been blocked as discriminatory. And of course, although Shelby County did not come out of Texas, the very first reaction to the court's giant step backward came from the Attorney General here, who announced almost immediately in social media that the state would seek and would begin to implement its restrictive voter ID provision that had been blocked as a result of the Voting Rights Act provision effectively disabled by the court majority's opinion. So even though that case did not come from Texas, Texas found a way to thrust itself into the forefront of this critical ongoing struggle to secure the voting rights of everyone. And of course, at the same time the Supreme Court was rendering these decisions, we had critical historical action being taken in the United States Senate, where the Senate was enacting comprehensive immigration reform in the form of Senate Bill 744, a bill that has many troubling provisions in it, a bill that we must work to improve, but still a historical achievement that the United States Senate in 2013 had taken a step toward reforming our immigration system that continues to leave so many millions across the country who contribute every day to our economy and our society, who raise their children here, but are without legal protections because of the discrimination, because of the inequity, because of the inadequacy of our current immigration policy. And here, too, the state of Texas has taken a prominent role, for better or worse. At this point, I simply point out that one of your senators, a Latino senator here in Texas, has regrettably demonstrated that he will be one of the greatest obstacles to ensuring that we have progressive immigration reform that will protect all of those in need, all of those who have earned the protection of the law. So the theme and the reason it's appropriate that we are here in Texas in this time of the year is about Texas's importance and all of the critical policy issues facing our nation. This is also the right year, 2013, because as you all know, in November of 2012, seemingly for the third or fourth time, pundits recognized that the Latino community had a voice, had a vote, and would exercise that vote in a way to significantly change public policy for the better. The November 2012 election marked the most recent occasion, but perhaps the most important and significant occasion when the importance of the Latino vote was recognized. But we cannot allow that to be a single moment in history. We cannot allow those pundits who belatedly recognized our presence and importance to limit, to limit the impact of that achievement. It was not merely about an electoral outcome. It was about policy choices. It was about policy outcomes. It was about the Latino community making its voice heard in support of changes for the better, changes to promote civil rights, changes to promote the access of everyone to critical public services. And so November 2012 was not an ending, but a beginning for all of us in the Latino community to take on together those critical policy challenges. It means with respect to the ongoing debate over immigration reform now in the House of Representatives that we have a responsibility as a community to make our voices heard to make our voices here heard about those provisions that we object to, will not tolerate as a part of a comprehensive bill, and to identify those provisions that we see as essential, that we see as critical to this nation's future, 
and as a necessary part of comprehensive immigration reform. And so it falls on the Latino community with respect to voting rights to ensure that the Supreme Court majority's decision to disable that critical provision is not permanent, but that we secure from the Senate and House a revived coverage formula that will again put at the forefront, that will again ensure the protection of the voting rights of everyone. And with respect to education, though we can take solace in the Fisher outcome, that affirmative action in higher education, the ability to take steps to ensure equal educational opportunity in university admissions will continue, our challenge in the Latino community is nevertheless still great. We must work to ensure that the pipeline, kindergarten through 12th grade, preschool, kindergarten through 12th grade, provides equal opportunity tailored to the needs of students so that all of our students, all of our children, can thrive and succeed in obtaining admission to the, uni to the University of Texas, other flagship universities around the country, and the programs that would put them and their families on the road to prosperity. But it's appropriate that we're here in Texas, not just because Texas, for better or worse, so often thrusts itself to the forefront of policy discussions affecting the entire nation. But it's auspicious that we're here because of the history of the Texas Latino community. It's not just Maldef that was founded here. LULAC, the League of United Latin American Citizens, the oldest Latino civic organization in the country, also founded here in Texas. Even more recently here in San Antonio, the efforts around COPS and other organizations have demonstrated the power of the Latino community to come together to create real policy change. And so the challenge for the Latino community to step forward and work together to secure the best immigration reform, to secure the continued protection of voting rights, to secure ultimately and finally equal educational opportunity for all, appropriately begins here in Texas where the Latino community, in the face of so much continuing adversity, has so often stepped forward to organize as a community to impact policy, to impact change. For all of these reasons, it's appropriate that we are here at this time to have this critical discussion about the issues facing Latinos, not just in the state of Texas, but truly across the nation. So welcome to this discussion. I now will join our esteemed panelists so we can discuss some of these critical issues facing Texas, facing Texas Latinos, but facing the entire nation. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Let me introduce our panelists, the esteemed group of experts on many of the critical issues, uh, nay, all of the critical issues facing the Latino community today. Um, furthest away from me, I'd like to introduce Ivan Gutierrez, who is the Vice President for Public Affairs and Government Relations <laughs> for Planned Parenthood Gulf Coast. Welcome, Ivan. Thank you. Next to her, one of uh, my nemeses, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> One of my longtime partners in crime. I'm sure that's the way many would see what we do, but one of our most successful attorneys and a voting rights expert, recognized across the country, Vice President of Litigation at Maldef, Nina Perales. Uh, next to her, one of those legislators in Austin viewed as troublesome, <laughs> as mentioned by David Hinojosa in his remarks but truly a champion for not just the Latino community, but the entire state of Texas, the Honorable Rafael Anchia, Texas State Representative. <laughs> and to, to my immediate right, good friend and longtime collaborator uh, with MALDEF and its education work, a frequent provider of expert testimony and expert analysis, the President and CEO of the Intercultural Development Research Association, Dr. Maria Cuca Robledo Montesel. <laughs> so 
So talking with myself. The theme was about Texas thrusting itself, of my remarks, to the forefront of so many issues, distinguishing itself for better or worse, as we discussed. 45 states in this country have agreed on a common core set of standards for education. Texas, not one of them. Indeed, Texas has decided to go on its own and not adopt common core of standards and curriculum uh, along with those 45 states. What does that mean? What exactly is the state of Texas doing in terms of the curriculum that it provides in public education to so many Latino students and all of the other students in Texas public schools? Texas today is back to the 1950s. Um, the state of Texas has taken a step back from a curriculum that would prepare our young people, all young people to go to college, to a tracking system. A tracking system that um, will most certainly be a massive um, devolution of our children going into low-level courses that do not prepare them to go to college. I'll give you an example, Tom, of um, what is being offered. So the legislature adopted HB 5, the 83rd legislature, um, abandons college-ready graduation plans. Here's what kids can instead take. Construction, welding, automotive technology, heating, ventilation, and air conditioning, and all of these are used to replace what used to be advanced classes in science, math, and social studies. And so kids can go into health occupations and prepare to be LVNs. They can go to culinary arts and prepare to be cooks. They can go to hospitality and prepare to be hotel front desk workers. All of those jobs are low paying. It is our students who will be sent into those low level connect the dot curricula that will not prepare them to go to college. So we have a very steep road ahead of us to change this now fact in the state of Texas. And I hear and we work with parents all of the time who are strongly objecting to and mobilizing against this. We work with women in the colonias in South Texas who say, among other things, one woman said, yo quiero decidir, no la escuela, si mi hijo es materia para la universidad. I want to decide, not have the school decide, whether my son or daughter is going to college, and I want them to go. So we've got lots of work to do. The default high school curriculum plan, by the way, no longer requires Algebra two. What that means is that students will not be prepared to go into college. You mentioned that this would, of course, have a particular impact on the Latino community, but what will it mean for the state of Texas as a whole, particularly in a context where, at this point, half of public school students in the state of Texas are Latino? Yes. Throughout the entire state, the second most populous state in the country. What will this mean for the state of Texas as a whole? What it means for the state of Texas is that the state of Texas cannot compete economically. What it means for our children is that they cannot compete and that they cannot better themselves and their families and their communities. Um, an interesting fact, some of you may have picked up um, a NPR series, I think it was aired last month, called Hispanic Shift. There was a fabulous little uh, factoid there um, that I wanted to share with you. They said, they declared, that his Hispanic two-year-olds rule here is why. So a lot has been said, a lot has been written about how young Latinos are and how we need Latinos to be educated so they can go into the workforce, et cetera, et cetera. But this is the statistic that really hits. In 2010, there were more Hispanic two-year-olds than any other age in Texas. And you know what the most popular age for whites in Texas was? 50-year-olds. Those two-year-olds, those 197,000 two-year-olds, Hispanic two-year-olds in 2010, are now five years old. 
They're coming into pre-K. They're coming into our schools. The state of Texas has got to shift its focus, adjust to this Hispanic shift, know that we're all in this together, and assure that our kids have high quality schooling for everyone. Re Representative Anchia, talk about another opportunity for this growing Latino community in Texas. I mentioned in my remarks that regrettably uh, Senator Cruz has sort of set himself up in the Senate debate uh, as someone who is going to come forward with amendments that were really contrary to the spirit of the reform that's necessary, really contrary to what the Latino community certainly seemed to have voted for in November. But obviously Senator Cruz does not represent the Latino community uh, at large in Texas is not the, the sole representation. We've now moved to the House of Representatives where we have more Latino representatives. We have representatives of all races who have significant Latino constituencies coming here out of Texas. Talk to us about what Texas's role should be, can be, with respect to federal immigration reform at this point. Well, I view Texas as, uh, as having the most to gain or the most to lose from this effort. Uh, people talk about California, but frankly, we have uh, the greatest percentage of border uh, in the United States. We have a, a very large Latino population uh, and also a very large undocumented population. Um, so if we get, uh, if, if we don't get comprehensive immigration reform done, uh, I feel it will inure to the detriment of our state. Um, I worry about the prospects for uh, Senate Bill 744, the, the, the Senate version of comprehensive immigration reform, or any other bill. Uh, because of the polarizing nature of, of politics in Washington. But it wasn't just Washington. Early on this legislative session, I filed along with Ana Hernandez Luna, who um, last year during the, the quote unquote sanctuary cities uh, debate uh, revealed that she had come to this country undocumented um, and was able through the 1986 reform to uh, achieve status and now serves Houston admirably in the House of Representatives. So the two of us filed a comprehensive immigration reform uh, resolution. Again, non-binding, it was just a, a resolution to test the waters in the Texas legislature. And I remember talking to Paul Burka, who's the, uh, one of the, um, the, the political commentators at, at Texas Monthly, who runs the Burka blog, and he said, well, that's gonna pass. Uh, the Republicans who are in the majority in Texas need comprehensive immigration reform, frankly, more than the Democrats. And uh, I said, well, you know, I hope you're right, Paul. And we worked tirelessly to, uh, to, to get this simple non-binding resolution passed. And, and I will also note that we drafted it in a way where we borrowed from conservative think tanks like the Cato Institute, uh, from the Texas uh, uh, Republican Women's Resolution, from uh, a comprehensive immigration reform resolution that had been filed by a Republican member of, of the state legislature. So we tried to really package it in a way to make it palatable and not provocative. Um, but I tell you what, we, we could not get the thing to a vote on the House floor. And that hurt, happened early on in the, leg, in the legislative session. And I thought to myself, oh gosh, if we can't get a simple resolution on the House floor that's geared and, and drafted in such a way to make it palatable to our, uh, to our friends on the other side of the aisle, we're, we're, I, I, I fear that um, the toxic nature of politics in Washington is going to make it uh, worse. And it really turned out to be the canary in the coal mine, because even though we did get uh, a favorable vote out of committee, the State Affairs Committee, with some Republican support. We got uh, a Republican joint author in Jason Villalba, uh, who, who really did work hard on the, on the legislation. We couldn't get it done. And, uh, and now we're seeing that play out in the House of Representatives. And the Senate side, you had this bipartisan coalition of, of senators. 68 senators voted for this bill. An imperfect bill, as you noted in your opening comments but uh, a, a bill that moved the process forward. You had 68 members do that, many of whom stuck their necks out to do it, uh, including Marco Rubio, whom I have to give quite a bit of, of credit for, um, for having uh, championed this, this issue. Uh, and, then, and then we saw the unfortunate developments where our two Texas senators um, abdicated the field uh, on, on comprehensive immigration reform with, with Senator Cruz 
being especially provocative. And um, I saw it as an interesting dynamic, because here you had uh, Senator Rubio and Senator Cruz, two Cubans, uh, one uh, who was uh, working very hard to get the comprehensive immigration reform done, both with presidential ambition, by the way. And, uh, and then suddenly you had Senator Cruz taking shots at Senator Rubio uh, and, and really um, scuttling the process. And, and, and it's unfortunate. And Senator Cornyn, I think, is, is feeling himself being pulled to the right by Senator Cruz. Uh, it's unfortunate because, as I said at the outset, we have so much to gain. I mean, we have so much to gain in terms of getting people out of the shadows, law enforcement benefits, uh, uh, tax collections. I mean, all, all kinds of things, um, improving the solvency of our Social Security Trust Fund nationally. All these things that would make it in the enlightened self-interest of everybody in Texas to be for this. Uh, but we have people, I think, for political reasons that uh, want to keep um, throwing darts. And on the House side, it's, uh, you know, the, 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 the bill appears dead, unfortunately. And I, I've, met, I've met with, uh, on comprehensive immigration reform, with uh, a number of, of different House members on both sides of the aisle. And what I'm hearing from the, the Republican leadership is that they're, they're just not going to move forward with the Senate bill. So what are the backup plans? What, what, what is left at that point if they don't move forward with the Senate bill? Well, we may get a piecemeal approach. That's what they're talking about, doing high net worth uh, employment-based visas in one bill and possibly another bill related to uh, H-1B visas, which are the, the high skill workers, and another one for ag, and maybe something for the dreamers, but all in a piecemeal fashion and not, not really solving the big issue at hand, nothing that will certainly bring the benefits to Texas that we, we need. So um, if, if the piecemeal approach passes the House and then doesn't pass the Senate, you have both of the bodies with different approaches, uh, nothing's going to get done. And I, and I think that's really a tragedy, not only for the state of Texas, but for our, for our community. I will add further that um, a, a further backup plan would be the administration actually going forward to, to do something. Um, and, and you saw President Obama uh, move forward with uh, DACA, the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, which was a temporary fix for, for young people who were, were brought here uh, by their parents at, at a young age. It expires. I mean, that is not, uh, it is an administrative action. It is not statutory in nature. The House, in, in what I thought was a, a, a uh, uh, sad move, uh, actually voted to overturn DACA. It, obviously, it didn't po uh, pass the Senate. But a majority of the House voted to overturn uh, uh, DACA at the federal level, and um, you know that was clearly a symbolic vote, which is problematic, and, 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 and lets you know where the House is. So uh, really, the, the president and the administrator and the executive branch will, will have to provide some relief, uh, extension possibly of DACA and other things, if in fact the, the House and the Senate fail to come to an agreement. Of course, uh, I, I, I'm not quite ready to give up hope yet. The hope still is that the House of Representatives comes up with some bill or bills that can go into a conference committee with the Senate on their comprehensive approach and hopefully come up with something that would go to a single vote in each House. What do you think Texas Latinos can or should do to influence the outcome if we get that far uh, of an ultimate vote on something that would provide the legalization, the, the protections that are so necessary not just for this state but for really the entire country and for its economy and for its society to continue to thrive. You know, I always talk about playing ping pong and chess at the same time, right? Ping pong where you beat the ball back in rapid succession and that's your short term, short -term play and then chess is your long term play. So the short term play, I think, uh, for, for Latinos is that we go ahead and, and, and let our voices be heard with those House members, those members of Congress uh, who sit on the relevant committees, be they from Texas or not, but especially the Texans. Uh, you know, I, I used to, I've always debated since I've been in the legislature, my, my friends on the other side of the aisle on immigration or photo ID uh, or sanctuary cities. And in, in moments of weakness on occasion, um, you know, they'll, they'll point out uh, a couple things. Sometimes they'll say, well, why, Rafael, why do I want to do this? Because I'll create um, you know, 10 million more Democrats. Uh, sometimes that's the pre pretext for doing it, uh, for, for, for not doing anything. Or other times, uh, but more often what I hear is, well, you know, I never hear from Latinos in, in my state office. And it's 100 or 200 or 500 to 1 maybe 
uh, of, of letters against my action on a, a an issue like comprehensive immigration reform, uh, rather than uh, just a very few um, uh, um, calls or letters or emails for. So it's really important. Sometimes people underestimate how important that is. So that's the short game. I mean, we really do have to write the letters and send the emails to, to the people who represent us and let, us, let them know how we feel. Um, yeah. But the long game, and it's something that was alluded to in the opening comments, uh, is, is really voter participation. Because right now, despite what we heard in November of 2012, where Latinos nationwide decided a number of important races and helped propel the president uh, uh, to re-election, uh, I don't think our friends on the other side of the aisle are really scared of our vote. They're just not scared. And sometimes, I, I, they're, they're certainly more scared of people on, on the far right, the tier, Tea Party, than they are of us. So the long game is, uh, things that we used to do when I, when I chaired Naleo, ya es hora ciudadanía, getting Latino legal permanent residents to become citizens, right? And, and, and I, I found that when we were doing the ya es hora ciudadanía, um, our, our, our recent converts were our greatest zealots, right? It was, it, I saw a much greater bang for our buck in getting uh, abuelita uh, to go from legal permanent residency to citizenship rather than getting a 17-year-old who's turning 18 to vote, because that abuelita with her newfound rights and responsibilities is gonna go vote. That's just gonna happen. So you have uh, legal permanent residents to citizens, um, working on, on voter education for our young people, continuing to fight these uh, disenfranchising photo ID laws, and I worry now with uh, the overturning of, of uh, Section 4 of the Voting Rights Act, polling locations. I mean, there's all kinds of opportunities for mischief. So, so really holding uh, officials accountable, elections officials accountable. So I, I, you've laid an agenda that depends heavily on what happens at the ballot box, and getting folks there and getting folks registered and getting folks participating and getting folks really waiting in long lines, doing whatever it takes to exercise their franchise. But you've also appropriately recognized that Shelby County versus Holder, the case I mentioned, has presented some barriers. So, um, Ms. Perales, what's, what's next? We're sort of left with this body blow from the uh, Supreme Court majority taking out the Section 4 coverage formula. What does it particularly mean in Texas, and what are the steps that need to be taken here in response to that decision? Well, you're absolutely right. It was a terrible blow to the work that we've been doing with the Voting Rights Act. And, uh, you know, Texas was covered statewide under Section 5 through the coverage formula because Texas was a historical bad actor. And since Texas became covered in 1975, just looking at statewide redistricting, in every single decade since the coverage of Texas, one or more redistricting plans were struck down as discriminatory against Latino voters. So not only is Texas a historical bad actor, bad actor enough to get it covered, but since then, Texas has not really learned how to create laws that are fair to Latinos and that create equal opportunity. So we think that Texas is the poster child for using other parts of the Voting Rights Act to bring Section 5 coverage back. And there is another part of the Voting Rights Act that we're working with right now we are still in the middle of the 2013, well, it was 2011 and then it was 2012 and now it's 2013 redistricting litigation. We're still very much in that case. And this case can serve not only to repair the discriminatory redistricting plans that were passed by the state in 2011, but this case can now serve as the vehicle to invoke another portion of the Voting Rights Act to ask our judges to make a specific finding of intentional racial discrimination in this litigation, and we have more than enough evidence to prove that here, to make that finding and to order that Texas come back under the preclearance requirement of Section 5, which will require it to get federal approval for voting changes. And that's something that we're working on right now, in fact, as it just came from the office, and we were working on a piece of that. You know, the other, so, the other part of this is, is community-based. We, we have to get old school about protecting our voting rights. 
We had the coverage of Section 5 and the requirements. Right now, we don't. And we certainly are working with our other civil rights organizations to restore some of that legislation in Washington, D.C. with Congress. But we really need to own some of this ourselves. And towards that end, uh, we are working with other Latino organizations to create a network where people can use social media to share stories about potentially discriminatory measures that are being passed in local communities and share resources around how to oppose those changes locally. Cities, school districts, municipal utility districts, counties in Texas right now do not have to pre-clear their voting changes. Some of them inevitably will be up to no good and it's going to be our job to spot them, to call them out, and to make them stop. So to just be clear about what's going on, your attempt to bail in the state of Texas in our litigation would apply to the state of Texas, would ensure that if the state tries to do something like the voter ID provision in the future or uh, redistricting in the future, it would again be required to pre-clear. But as you mentioned, Texas, the entirety of the state was previously covered, and that meant every sub-jurisdiction, every city, every school district, every county, anything they wanted to do, they would have to submit to be pre-approved by the Department of Justice. So, Nina, you, you know that some of those on the other side of the issue have flippantly suggested that maybe, maybe, those who were previously covered will show some greater responsibility now because previously if they did something crazy, the Department of Justice was always there to save them from themselves and say, stop, no, you can't do that. You may say you want to do that to please your crazy constituents, but no, you can't do that. We're going to make you be responsible. So is it possible that this means those jurisdictions across Texas will be more responsible about changes? What are you hearing? What are you seeing in terms of the well, reaction to no longer having to submit for preclearance? Most recently, um, we have a, a, something of a success story out of a town outside of Houston called Pasadena, Texas. As soon as he heard about the Shelby decision and the lifting of the preclearance requirement, the mayor announced in a city charter revision commission that he would like to change the system of election in the city and noted specifically that their current single member district system was causing him some alarm because the Latino population was approaching 50% in almost four of their existing districts. He cited that there was still not enough citizenship, but it seemed to him, I think, that it was going to happen sooner, if not later. And so he suggested a radical change to the way the city would elect its uh, city council. And, and that change, of course, would reduce the uh, power of the Latino vote in the city. And uh, Luckily, there were people there at the Charter Review Commission, even though there was, it was not audio taped or anything, they became upset. They called people that they know who called people that they knew, and folks started showing up and saying, this is discriminatory against the Latino community, and this is a very bad idea. They shone a strong light on that mayor's proposal, and as a result, it has been withdrawn. So your story really means that we're not necessarily seeing that they're acting any more responsibly, but that the community can enforce responsibility on them, uh, even though their instincts might have them choosing to act irresponsibly in response. That's too many responses, but <laughs> act irresponsibly in the aftermath of uh, the Shelby County decision. So Nina, one of the things that did occur in, in special session in the legislature uh, was uh, the adoption of a new redistricting map instead of an attempt to go back to the original 2011 redistricting map. We've talked about bail-in, but what's going to happen with those districts? Well, the Texas legislature did enact a new set of redistricting lines. I think they did so in response to the fact that they were boxed in quite heavily in court. Uh, two, federal, two sets of federal judges had reviewed the 2011 redistricting plans and found them to be discriminatory in one way or another. I think Texas saw the writing on the wall and said that they were going to enact some plans that made significant improvements for the Latino community. There are some folks who are still disputing those plans, and so the litigation will probably go forward uh, with respect to that. But I think even if we do know better than we have up until now, it will have been significant progress for the Latino community. So 
that redistricting map was adopted in special session, but didn't, didn't get the most attention of what the state legislature did in special <laughs> session. So once again, consistent with the theme, Texas thrust itself to the forefront <laughs> of an issue of national concern. So Ms. Gutierrez, can you tell us about House Bill 2 and, and particularly what, what it means for the state of Texas and for Latinos and Latinas in the state of Texas? Sure. So I think when we discuss HB2, I think it's important to look at what the legislature has been working on for, for quite some time. And I, I look at, you know, the legislative leadership and, and their um, intent to continue to politicize women's health and all aspects of reproductive health care from the family planning budget decimation uh, forward. But in HB2, we saw something very interesting. Throughout the regular session, the legislature was not able to pass a single uh, bill that attempted as it was to say, to regulate abortion. Um, there were enough votes in the Senate to block that legislation from coming down. Um, and really, there was a strong voice in the Senate who said, you know, I'm a pro-life member, but these bills do absolutely nothing to prevent abortion. And so legislative session, regular session ends, special session called on redistricting, no blocker bill. No opportunity to block any legislation from, from coming to the floor um, was the rule that Lieutenant Governor Dewhurst imposed going into the special session. And we knew pretty much that abortion would be added to the call um, as, you know, there was a lot of, um, how do I say this? There was a lot of... Um, Jockeying to the right. Maybe? Thank you. I, I, I wanted to let the representative say that. <laughs> <laughs> But um, yes, that, that the red meat was needed, if you will, um, to, to bring that issue to the forefront. And so we um, were waiting to see what that bill would look like. And lo and behold, it was really a combination of all of the measures that had been filed during the legislative session and really the most egregious bill, um, that the targeting abortion that we've seen across the country. It included a ban. Um, post 20 weeks and there was a lot of discussion around what that really meant um, and really an, an attempt to kind of boast that as, as the largest part of the bill but what really the, the kind of the meat of the bill was um, a measure that would require all abortion facilities in Texas to abide by or to become in essence ambulatory surgical centers um, which you know as we know basically have to have operating rooms have to operate in a certain way have to have all of these um, really regulations and um, added um, necessities such as the size of your janitor's closet. You have to have men and women's lockers. You have to have showers. All of these things that are really not necessary um, to, to perform a safe and legal abortion. And on, on top of that was a measure that would also require medication abortion, um, which um, can be used up to, up to 10 weeks gestation to um, be used on label. And so really the difference there between on label and off label, you know, for instance, you know, Wellbutrin can be used for smoking cessation, you know, use Tylenol for, you know, for stroke patients, um, but would require the on label usage, which would actually require twice the dosage. So there were, you know, and really in an effort to make physicians not want to prescribe that medication because it was not, you know, within their own oath to do so. Um, and, you know, really also requiring physicians to have admitting privileges. Now, physicians are granted admitting privileges for hospitals because they do a lot of work at those hospitals. And physicians grant, or hospitals will grant physicians those admitting privileges because um, they're going to be bringing a lot of business to the hospital. So then you require a physician to have admitting privileges who provides abortion. They are not admitting patients, really, because the complication rate is, is less than, than 1%. Um, and really there is, you know, a target on their back because, you know, are they then now going to be targeted as a hospital that uh, requires admitting privileges? So it was really a bill that collectively would turn Texas in, into Mississippi um, and close all but um, six abortion clinics in Texas when it, where we have 47 now and because the state is so large. So when we, you know, when this bill was moving, we knew it was going to move, and it was a point in which women were coming to tell their story because this was taking, I mean, talk about going back to the 1950s. We actually had women come to the Capitol dressed in 50s garb head to toe um, to show that this is, we're talking pre-Roe here. 
um, in, in essence of, of the bill and, and what it would do to access in Texas. Oh, and the first House hearing in the, in the first special session, over 700 women came to tell their story. Um, then the House was to debate the bill. Um, 2,000 um, people showed up um, in protest of the bill. And then on the day of the, as you know, as we all know, filibuster um, by Senator Wendy Davis in the Senate to, um, to stop the bill from, from moving forward, um, thousands really thousands of people crowded the Capitol. And you know, I, I want to say, and I want, you know, I think that, you know, it's the other side, if you will, or, you know, um, opponents of, of access to abortion will say, well, this was a regulation bill. This, this did nothing but make abortion, you know, safer than it really was. And in, in reality, it did not do that. But I also think that it was, you know, they went so far. They went so far that women and, and men and families were realizing that this has gone to a point in which we cannot take this sitting down anymore. You know, we saw a mandatory sonogram bill that was passed in Texas with really little fanfare. Last legislative session, Representative Anchia remembers that and, and all of the work that he and his colleagues did on that bill. Um, but here we are in another, in a special session where this bill is basically being forced in, you know, into law. All the Capitol is filled, you know, thousands of people and it didn't matter, and, and it was the leadership in the Senate was really looking at every opportunity to strike Wendy Davis down in, her, in, in order to filibuster this bill. And what we, what we know now, I think, is that we have to take this opportunity, because as we know, filibuster happened, success, then Governor Perry proceeded to call another special session on all items that did not move forward in the first special session, which meant the abortion bill, and which was a 30-day period. I mean, there, there was no filibustering when you have that much time on the clock. And we knew the bill was going to pass, so that at, at that point it was, you know, people were still coming to the Capitol. It was amazing. There were thousands and thousands of people there to tell their story in the House, in the Senate. Hearings were going night and day, and it really didn't matter. I mean, there were signs all over the Capitol about, you know, not being disruptive, because, you know, this unruly mob sense, uh, right, which was the most well-behaved unruly mob I've ever seen. But um, it was as though it, nothing mattered. And I think that as we move forward and away from that, we have to remember that our actions um, and what we do at the ballot box and how we are able to demonstrate our, really, just any, any piece of legislation that is going to block access to health care. You don't know any one person's situation. We saw the legislature, as, as I mentioned, um, dismantle the family planning program last session by two-thirds, so cut that funding. And then you come and you see that they are making abortion almost impossible to access. But you are also cutting family planning programs for the poorest of the poor, minority Latinas and undocumented. And then you are limiting access to abortion. And then as we've talked about, an education. Um, and you know, Perry also vetoed the equal pay um, bill, which would then, you know, so at what point are we going to say women really are the most disenfranchised population, I mean, in this state? Because where in, you know, in what fashion are you able to break that cycle of really just burden? You, you began your response, I think, appropriately by saying you need to situate this in the context of all of what's happening right. around health care. Yes. So talk a little bit about what is what does the Affordable Care Act mean to the Texas Latina and Latino population? What has the state of Texas done in terms of Medicaid expansion that might either take advantage of the positive elements or might restrict those? Well, I think that when you look at Medicaid expansion, which our governor, as we all know, was very um, adamant that would not you know, happen for the state of Texas and, and would, not, would veto any bill that came out of the legislature to expand, uh, Medicaid. We look at the Affordable Care Act in that we are now getting people's attention about enrolling and about access to health care. Um, and in, you know, where we've seen, when, and when we talk about family planning funding and the budget, that also includes, I mean, Latinas have the highest rate of deaths of cervical cancer than any other population in Texas and across the country. You know, access to health care, there are very, I mean, primary care providers in Texas few and far between, unfortunately. So not only do you not have health care, you don't have a health care provider, especially when you are looking at um, you know, South Texas. 
So when the Affordable Care Act comes in and there is, you know, opportunity, here's opportunities for enrollment, but you are only looking at 100% of the federal poverty level and above, right? So that, and then in Texas, we've got the lowest rate of, you know, really Medicaid eligible adults at 17 to 18%, right around there. So such a very large gap, the poorest of the poor that then do not have access. But I think that as we create the opportunity for awareness around the Affordable Care Act, enrollment, what do I qualify for? How can I make healthcare a part of my life? And then how are these people also advocating for Medicaid expansion? I mean, once again, clearly unfair that this population is not going to have access to anything. And how do you, you know, we, we've talked about as well within the healthcare community, not be the disappointer um, when you are trying to enroll people for, for you know, the, the, the new exchange in saying that, okay, well, you know, at the end of the day, you've gone through this seven page application and, and you don't qualify for anything. And, you know, that, that has really got to change. And I think that when we look at the whole spectrum of women's health, um, you know, in, in how it plays into the Affordable Care Act, what we saw at the Capitol, even though, you know, taking it away from, from House Bill 2 and the abortion issue and really stopping the marginalization and the politicization of women's health and taking it to the next level and really empowering women and Latinas, especially because it affects them the most, to, to fight back. So, Dr. Monticello, I mean, surely the state's reluctance to invest in health care for its population is because it's spending money on other important things like education. <laughs> right. So right. update us on where the state is in terms of its well, investment so, in education. So we have um, two of the best litigators in school finance, uh, not only in the state of Texas, but in the country, um, David Hinojosa and Al Kaufman are here and can tell you uh, story after story about what the state of Texas has refused to do in terms of funding. So um, funding in Texas is inadequate, it is unfair, it is inefficient, it is made worse by the desire of state leadership to invest in private schooling with public dollars. And so we have a steep road ahead of us back to court in uh, January, um, despite the fact that um, funding for public schools is unfair, inadequate, inefficient. We have the state of Texas um, investing dollars in increasing the number of charter schools that are available in the state. We believe that our kids deserve a high quality education as a matter of civil right and that they uh, should not be relegated to education by lottery. Civil rights are not to be accorded by lottery and therefore we continue to work really hard to make sure that schools and communities have the resources to uh, educate uh, kids. Um, it's an uphill battle, but we uh, keep going at it. I think that our families and our communities are doing the, the work that is necessary of the kind that Nina spoke about. Um, we need to, to go back to documenting what are the effects on our kids in our schools of the uh, inadequacies, the unfairness, and the inequities uh, in school finance that continue uh, unabated in the state of Texas. Um, the state of Texas has been pushed and pulled, as you know, for decades on this issue, and now they want to claim that in the 2013 session everything was fixed because um, a little bit of the money uh, that mm -hmm. was taken <laughs> out to the tune of $6 billion in 2011 uh, has been put back. Those cutbacks that affected preschool, that affected bilingual ed, that affected college access, that affected uh, teacher-student um, ratios, made our classes bigger, um, all kinds of bad things happened, um, aren't going to be fixed with a little bit of money. But here we are uh, back to uh, making a case uh, for why what the state of Texas has done um, 
is unconscionable, it is immoral, uh, it is illegal, and it must change. So inadequate investment in healthcare, inadequate investment continuing in education, a story that goes back uh, at least 40 years to the Supreme Court's deplorable decision that education is not a fundamental right under the U.S. Constitution. But surely then, despite its history as a bad actor, as Nina described, Representative Anchia, surely the state of Texas is then taking steps to ensure broad participation in democracy, making <laughs> identification readily available to everyone who's eligible. Talk a little bit about what's, what's going on in terms of facilitating participation in the state of Texas. You know, I, I, I have this discussion all the time with my friends uh, on the other side of the aisle. And, um, there, there is, a, there is a, a fairy tale that has been sold uh, in popular media that uh, the reason we need to increase restrictions on the franchise in the forms of photo identification is because you've got busloads of undocumented people, non-citizens coming uh, from Mexico to a um, state rep district near you, and they're all voting straight ticket Democratic. Um, uh, and as a former school board member in Dallas, uh, you know, I, I, I respond to them. And I said, "Wait a minute, wait a minute." So you're, you're telling me that that uh, an undocumented person uh, is going to cross the border, make a trip, uh, subject themselves to deportation in a 10-year bar from ever entering this country, commit a felony, by the way. Um, uh, and, and they're going to go through this big effort to change, you know, one vote in, in, in the case of this person, which is not a particularly scalable uh, model. Uh, and I said, when I was, a, when I was a, a school board member, I couldn't even get undocumented parents in the district that I represented to come to a town hall meeting or to a PTA meeting. You're going to tell me that they're going to show up in person uh, in front of uh, an election judge who has the power of a state district judge, potentially law enforcement at the polling location, and subject themselves to that risk, it just makes no sense. And in fact, um, despite the best efforts of Attorney General Abbott to perpetuate this uh, fairy tale and, uh, and call, um, uh, call uh, voter fraud in Texas epidemic, and then pursue uh, uh, photo identification, uh, there have been precious few cases of in-person uh, fraud uh, at the polls. In fact, um, the, the one that, that we uncovered when I served on the election committee and participated in, the, uh, in, in a study was a, a son who uh, was, uh, let's say, John Doe II uh, went to vote using, uh, or excuse me, John Doe III went to vote using his father's voter registration certificate because his father uh, was ill or something like that. But uh, nothing, nothing, no, no sort of uh, large scale in person voter uh, fraud. In fact, where the voter fraud uh, does occur, albeit um, relatively also minor cases, but where it does occur is in mail in ballot. And the photo ID legislation has nothing, uh, does nothing, and it's in fact specifically exempts mail in ballots from any photo identification requirements. So if you ask me, all right, if I wanted to commit fraud, uh, what model I would use trying to get a bunch of people to show up in person in front of election officials or use a completely anonymous system where people just fill out a document at home and mail it in, uh, I would use the latter, right? Uh, um, uh, but anyway, the, the fact that, that the, the photo identification, the justification for photo identification uh, uh, doesn't stand up to logic, and in fact, it was temporarily uh, um, overturned by a court until the Shelby County case uh, vacated that, that ruling um, is, is uh, besides the point, uh, I guess, for, for folks. The real crisis is not people showing up and voting fraudulently in the state of Texas. The real crisis is, our, in our democracy, is the lack of participation. Texas in 2000, when we had a sitting Texas governor uh, running for president, was 42nd out of 50 states in voter participation. Uh, in uh, 2004, when that sitting uh, Texas president was up for re-election, we were, uh, I want to say, 46 out of 50 states. During the o Obama phenomenon and all these new people coming to the polls in uh, 2008, we were 48 out of 50 states. And in 2010, uh, my best research suggests that we were 50th out of 50 states in voter participation. So the problem isn't that we have too many people voting who shouldn't be voting, is that we have too few 
voting that should be voting. And, and that is a, it a, pro, is a problem. Yet, uh, the, the, those in control in Texas want to erect more and more and more barriers to participation. And, and, and we did just did a, a, a quick study of the impact of photo ID, and, and we calculated it was going to be at, on the low case, not the high case. The Department of Justice said, said it might be as high as uh, 800,000 Texans. On the low case, it was 150,000 Texans. But, so I asked my friends on the other side, what's your appetite for disenfranchisement, right? Is it one? Is it 1,000? Is it 100,000? Is it 150,000? Is it 800,000? What is good enough? Because there were ways to fix it. We could say, hey, state of Texas, if you're going to move to a photo ID standard, give everybody a free photo ID. It's that simple. We had amendments to suggest that, but no, no, no. They didn't want to do that. They didn't want to make the IDs accessible. They didn't want to make them uh, widely available. Instead, uh, they wanted to make it more difficult to vote, and, and I think that's why the court in Washington, D.C. Uh, overruled the, uh, the law. So. Despite those efforts, of course, I mean, we've, so what we've got is inadequate investment in healthcare, inadequate investment in education, certainly inadequate investment in both resources and philosophy and broadening democratic participation. But surely, Ms. Pellis, the growth of the Latino community in Texas in the future, I hear the pundits saying this in the media, it's going to change Texas. Texas is going to become blue. Texas is going to become a state that is turning <laughs> away from <laughs> these <laughs> kinds of measures. Project the future for us. What do, you, what do you see happening as this second largest state sees its Latino population grow? Well, I think the true focus ought to be the squeeze that's being put on the Texas Latino population, the squeeze on health care, the squeeze on education, the lowering of standards, making our families sick, making it harder to register to vote, and making it harder to cast a ballot. The pundits, I think, are talking about something that is what pundits like to talk about. You hear pundits on one side, on the side of people who wear a D on their T-shirts, saying, ah, 2016, we're going to be a state where everybody has a D on their T-shirt. And then you hear pundits who wear R's on their T-shirts, saying, no, our party is mobilizing Latino community because Latinos are essentially conservative, and when the Latinos wake up, they will all be wearing ours on their t-shirts. What we don't really hear, and I think it's very important to listen for it, is anybody talking about Latino leadership or how Latinos are going to change the folks who have these on their t-shirts and ours on their t-shirts. We do not hear about the efforts to build, to train and identify Latino candidates. We don't hear about the efforts to bring Latinos into the leadership of those who wear the t-shirts to determine what the platforms are going to be. I mean, the, the demographic changes are undeniable. The question is whether this is a focus, and I hear the, Democrat, the, the Democrats and Republicans, the focus of the pundits, let's just bring them out like we're, like we're cattle to be herded. Bring them out for D t-shirts. Bring them out for R t-shirts. What about acknowledging that Latinos are going to own their own agenda and, and make a difference in terms of what the policy positions are going to be? That's what I listen for. So, uh all the panelists, we've got a few minutes left. I'm going to give each of you one minute. So we're here. We've, we've heard about the state of Texas, a critically important state, second most populous state in the country, really, for better or worse, at the forefront of a lot of the critical policy issues that the entire nation is grappling with. And we've heard about some of the problems within the state in addressing so many of those issues. So our program is the Latino State of the State for Texas. So each of you, in one minute, what would you tell those watching here or online that they should do to change the Latino state of the state for Texas in the next 12 months? Dr. Montesor. So India seems uh, um, far away, but I was struck, especially knowing that we would be here together today and that we would, among uh, many things, be talking about women and mothers and children and families. Uh, Kavita Ramdas, who is the Ford Foundation's representative for India, uh, writes about her horror at the spate of sexual violence in India. 
and her hopes for a future of justice, opportunity, and equality for all people. And she writes, she wrote this, and I think it's very um, um, insightful. She writes, we need less domination and more imagination to succeed in this world. We need uncommon women standing with uncommon men because our world faces uncommon challenges. We need them to be so strong that they can be gentle, so educated that they can be humble, so fierce that they can be compassionate, so passionate that they can be rational, and so disciplined that they can be free. Representative Anchia. At the risk of suggesting uh, that, uh, that we herd more cattle to the polls, um, uh, you know, th there's, no way, there's no way that anything is going to change unless we participate more. I mean, you know, we can, we can, until both Republicans and Democrats are competing for our vote, uh, until uh, we are voting in numbers that uh, radically change elections in this state, then I, I, I fear we will be ignored. Now, I will say um, that there are a lot of really good things happening, and, and you talk about Latino, Latino leaders, Nina. Um, we have some wonderful Latino leaders right here in San Antonio de Bear, uh, and that is uh, my, my former colleague in the State House, uh, Joaquin Castro, and his twin brother, Julian. You may have heard of his twin brother. I don't know. I'm sure. The mayor, the mayor of this town, uh, um, both of whom have uh, sprung onto the national stage and have done wonderful things. And, for, and, and put the media uh, s stuff aside. I mean, uh, Mayor Castro, I, I nominated him uh, at the Dallas Morning News to be Texan of the Year last year, uh, not, not for his speech at the Democratic National Convention, but for his very uh, brave and earnest work on uh, pre-K for SA here in, in San Antonio. Um, you know, it's hard in the middle of a recession to ask people to voluntarily raise their taxes to help low-income kids. I mean, that's a tough proposition for anybody to undertake, but he did it, brought together seven chambers of commerce, brought together the business community and the grassroots Latino advocacy community, the education community, and got it done. And for that, he deserved to be Texan of the Year. So I think the leadership uh, is coming. I think it starts right here in San Antonio. Mama is right here, Rosie Castro. <laughs> well, I'll throw in a sobering statistic, which is that every day in Texas we have more Latino native-born kids turning age 18 than we can register to vote. And uh, Lydia Camarillo, who's here, Vice President of Southwest Voter, knows that statistic and, and so many others as they, they move forward in trying to mobilize our community. We lose ground in terms of the number of eligible to the number of registered. So if you can do anything in the next 12 months, grab an 18-year-old you know, who's a US <laughs> citizen and register that person to vote and then take the younger brother or sister to a college campus near you and just show them around. I had the pleasure of doing that recently at UTSA downtown and some of the incredible work that was done by Al Kaufman and Maldef in the higher education litigation. I mean, there was a fantastic campus. I got to grab two nieces and take them to UTSA and show them what a beautiful place it is and what their real future can be. So do that too, please. Well, I mean, I feel like we're coming off of a very um, kind of important wave um, for women's health and, and really a movement that we hadn't seen in such a long time, especially as really the leadership in the legislature have been using women's health as its, you know, personal piñata for, you know, the last uh, three legislative sessions. And I think that we need to remember also, don't let them hijack our issue. Th these, are, these are our rights. This is our access to health care. This is, you know, reproductive rights or human rights. And I think that we need to remember to embrace that, to share that with one another. Uh, and as part of our education and the framework and education about healthcare and education about access and, and what, how important access is. And it feels like a lot of work and a lot to be, you know, how much are we, are we talking to folks? How much are they, you know, whatever, like hurting, right? Are we really hurting people to the polls and, and wanting them to vote on these issues? But really helping 
people understand how this affects their daily lives. You know, I mean, we're gonna look at a situation where west of I-35 and south of San Antonio, there are no providers. We're looking at a situation where, you know, unconstitutional laws are constantly being, um, you know, passed and then challenged, and we, we're continuing in this cycle, and, and it has to end somewhere, and, and it really ends with us joining together and, and not putting the responsibility on somebody else, taking that responsibility and growing our own leaders. Well, despite my best efforts, we had a conversation in Texas and we <laughs> did have to get to cattle. But <laughs> I have to just say, whatever, whatever the, the history of the state, we have great challenges, not just for Texas, but for the nation as a whole, whether it's about ensuring, finally, that there's equal educational opportunity and that so-called education achievement gap is ultimately eliminated, whether it's about ensuring that we can protect the millions who live in our communities, work with us uh, daily at school or in, at the workplace uh, to create a better America, to get the legal protections that they need through comprehensive immigration reform, whether it's about ensuring that we still know all of the changes in electoral practices that will restrict democracy rather than promoting participation and that we not only know about them but take the steps as a community to stop them. Whether it's about ensuring that health care is available to every woman in the state of Texas regardless of their income, regardless of the availability of a primary care doctor down the street, that they have access to the health care that they need. Whether it's about ensuring that the Latino community, as it grows into a majority of the population in Texas, is securing a state that is more attentive to all of these issues. What I know about the history of Latinos from MALDEF, from LULAC, from the other organizations that are a critical part of its history, what I know is that with respect to the Latino community, I don't see any cattle, I don't see any piñatas. I see a history of getting together and working to empower our community to serve everyone working to ensure that civil rights and access to services are the central core of any government, any state government, any local government's purpose. That history is one that we have at this point in time to take up at an unprecedented level. The future of this country, the future of the state depends on our looking to that history and coming together in the Latino community and with our allies and friends in other communities to ensure that the next Latino state of the state, the next discussion of these critical issues, can look even more hopefully to a future where all of the concerns of everyone are attended to. I want to thank the panelists for being with us today. Your, your eloquence and your expertise has served us all, and I know that great things will come from this discussion. I want to thank everyone who's present in the room for being here and joining us in this discussion. I want to thank our producers, David Damian Figueroa, Cynthia Gutierrez, Stephanie Loera, Jose Delgado, Aaron Ang, and the others who've worked with them for putting together yet another really successful discussion of critical issues facing our community. And I welcome all of you online to join us here, not just at the end of this conversation, but in this broader effort across the country to ensure that we in the Latino community take on the mantle of securing a better America. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.